tough act. <laughs> Wes Jensen, Omaha, Sacramento, too. Um, thank you all for being willing to listen to the people. I really appreciate that because we are in the second house to this body. Um, I, what, I, what I want to talk about today, obviously there's numerous research that shows the social benefit to our students when they receive social and emotional learning. From reducing behaviors in the classroom to helping address issues of absenteeism to making sure that they're able to graduate. Um, but one thing that um, I have actually was just made aware of uh, this morning and did a little research is the financial benefit of social emotional learning. And so um, there is, especially at the elementary level, you see a lot of benefit from it. And so uh, I will be sure to email this to all of you and including those members who are busy at the other non-public. Uh, hearing, so. um, but just want to state it out so that everyone is aware that, and again, there's not as much research, but the research that has been developed in the last five, seven years and continuing to be shows a huge in economic impact and benefit to our community. So um, there was one instance in the Seattle Social Development Program. It realized that the economic value for it came to realize that the economic evaluation estimated a return on investment that exceeded $2,500 per participant on the outcomes, such as increased likelihood to graduate from high school, lower rates of initiating sexual activity, and less criminal activity among group participants. The Life Skill Project uh, had another benefit. This low-cost intervention, roughly $3,400 per participant, Delivered by teachers in middle classroom settings addresses risk for substance use analysis, uh, components of teaching, self-management skills, social skills, and information. Oh, weird, that's just what SLE is, nothing more. Um, and that return of investment was almost $1,300 per participating, representing over $37 return to participants and society per dollar invested. Um, and then I do have some others. Oh, there's another one. $11 for every dollar toward intervention. Um, and so it's a good economic benefit um, and also all the other benefit it provides our students. And then another uh, research shows a lot of benefits to programs that we have to spend on reading and math. At the elementary level, it saves a little over $100,000. Um, Pro-social behaviors, 36,000. Concentration problems, 49,000. Truancy saves 30,000. Bullying behavior, 60. Uh, aggressive, disruptive behavior, 70,000. Suspensions, 33. And at the high school level, it does drop, um, but I think that's why it's critical that we invest in it, especially at the early levels, but reading and math, 71,000. Truancy, 3,000. Suspensions, 11,000, again, at the secondary level. So. Um, there is many, many benefits to SEL, and I thank you all for being willing to hear that, and also I know that you have been advocating and will continue to, so I encourage your colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Yeah. Wes? Yep. Um, so some of the data you just shared, you uh, there's a clearinghouse that I've worked with since I was a freshman senator called the Hunt Institute. Are you familiar with that? I am not. I strongly recommend that you look into it based on what you just shared with us. Yeah, will do. Thank you. My name is Renee Jones. I'm a current educator with Lincoln Public Schools and the 2023 Nebraska Teacher of the Year. However, I'm here representing my personal views. All of this talk about social emotional learning got me thinking about, this isn't a new concept. Why is this all of a sudden being spread everywhere? And so I did a little digging and realized that the term social emotional learning was developed in 1994 as a way to support just this integral life skills um, and have students successfully navigate school and life. The term was coined as just a way to give a common language and understanding to something that's been happening since the 20th century. Um, an example being the great philosopher John Dewey, and he was born in 1859. Um, so I just got to thinking about what are some of the core concepts that um, I use personally um, in my life and as my uh, role as an educator, um, because I believe that social emotional learning is really comprehensive 
Um, it's really integral to comprehensive education and focuses on developing students' emotional intelligence and interpersonal capabilities. Um, and SEL is founded on these five core competencies, and these are kind of the ones that I use them. So self-awareness, the ability to recognize and understand your own personal emotions, values, strengths, and weaknesses. Self-management, the skills necessary for emotional control, stress management, goal setting, and then of course self-discipline, social awareness, just the ability to understand others, including diverse cultures, backgrounds, and recognizing um, a variety of community resources and supports, relationship skills, um, just that establishing and maintaining healthy relationships, managing conflicts, and effective communication. And then of course, responsible decision-making, making constructive choices about personal behavior and social instructions based on ethical standards, um, safety considerations, and societal norms. Um, educators and school play, personnel play an instrumental role in the successful integration of SEL in our classrooms. Our students spend a significant amount of time with teachers um, and I think if we took a moment to pause, I imagine most of us, I certainly do, have um, the incredible experiencing of being able to name at least one teacher who had a significant impact on our own development. Educators are important mentors. I know that Ms. Berner, Mr. Musil, and Ms. Goodrich were three amazing educators that all played a huge significance in my role, in my personal development. Um, social emotional learning is a vital classrooms due to its multifaceted benefits. It supports academic success by enhancing students' abilities to manage their emotions, stay organized, make responsible decisions. It, bolter, it bolsters emotional well-being by teaching students how to understand, express, and regulate their emotions, thereby reducing stress and promoting mental health. SCL also fact, fosters essential social skills such as empathy, perspective, and relationship building, which enhances interpersonal relationships. By teaching impulse control and conflict resolution, SEL helps decrease classroom behavior, creating a more conducive learning environment. In the long term, SEL prepares students for challenging challenges beyond the classroom, equipping them with critical life skills for success in higher education, careers, and personal relationships. Moreover, it promotes equity by fostering understanding and respect among diverse students, um, contributing to a more inclusive school environment. And I, of course, just want to say um, thank you for this opportunity, and then um, thank you to all educators who are there and getting ready for their school years to begin and just support all kids. Thanks.
I guess I challenge you to think about is SEL or CRT or anything like that a problem that's identified by parents or is that a problem that's identified by politicians to fit their right wing agenda? So please listen to the teachers and listen to the parents and listen to the students. Am I a parent? Am I opposed? Um, <coughs> who've already spoken. Um, I didn't prepare anything formal, but I do want to say I mirror a lot of what's been said in regard to the fact that SEL is being used as a catchphrase for culture war issues that some of our legislators want to push through rather than addressing the real issues facing students um, in today's schools. Uh, I would say that school safety and teacher overturn is um, both huge issues. Um, I would say that the mental health of our students continues to decline and that our students continue to struggle and that the learning that is undertaken as a part of social emotional learning is exactly the kind of learning that can help students address those issues. Um, when we talk about student absenteeism, um, we also have to talk about students who do not attend school because they're being bullied. Um, and I think that includes a lot of our black, brown, indigenous students. It includes a lot of our LGBTQIA plus students. Um, and that there really is no way to teach all students without teaching about those diverse cultures. Um, and that in order to do that, really, we must examine ourselves as white people and what that means. That doesn't mean um, that we are discriminating, excluding, and indoctrinating people, as we heard uh, DEI refer to in the other meeting today. Um, it means that we are asking folks to be responsible citizens and I think that is really what is at the core of what public schools can do and why this education can be so important. Um, the fact that it has been politicized to the degree that it has is deeply disappointing um, because I do believe the majority of senators would much rather focus on issues that really do concern schools and teachers and administrators. And I don't think this is one of those issues. Um, and I would be happy to try to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Thank you. We've been here a lot this year. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll leave with that. And so the question I have for you, based on what you've observed this year, and based on what you just shared with us, why do you think we have so many bills that are really smoke and mirrors about culture wars? What do you think the intent is? Well, I think the intent often with that sort of legislation is don't look at what's going on behind the curtain as we change funding for public schools. Um, don't look at what's going on behind the curtain as we make it easier to carry and conceal weapons. Don't look at what's going on behind the curtain here as we take away the rights of women to be autonomous people in our society. But instead, look at all the boogeymen that we have. I also would say that these bills are primarily generated out of one or two very conservative groups um, that in Nebraska, we can directly tie some of the parents' rights groups 
two groups that have been named um, as hate groups, two groups whose ministry is about erasing um, the existence of LGBTQ and especially transgender um, people in the world. Um, and so I would say, really, you know, things come late often to Nebraska. Many other states have been dealing with legislation such as this for the last several years. I think it took time for this ideology to take root and to be brought forward. Um, unfortunately, I expect we'll be fighting these battles for quite a long time. Do you feel it further polarizes us as a state? I do, and I don't think that it is really what most Nebraskans value. Um, I have found that Nebraskans really value being good neighbors, that we overall believe in fairness and kindness. Um, I don't know that if we really talked deeply um, that we disagree on a lot of these issues. I think everyone wants to protect children. We don't want your straight children to be gay. We want our gay children to grow up. You know, there's a lot of 
misinformation about social emotional learning going around. Um, even I just heard some claims that it's part of a liberal agenda. Um, some of the things on that liberal agenda that I would like for everyone to know about would be let me just pull up a final graphic that I have. Um, self management, self awareness, social awareness, responsible decision making, and relationship skills are all sort of the five you know pillars of social emotional learning. Um, I did hear an inaccurate claim that this is how schools um, sort of use it as an avenue to introduce CRT into schools, which is also not true. Um, but I just wanted to get on the record and talk about that. Um, these are all things that as parents we're usually doing anyway. We're trying to teach our child how to manage their feelings, how to cope with the world, how to get along with other people, how to um, be responsible for themselves and have empathy for others. All of these things are extremely important in education. Um, especially when it comes to emotions, you know, I, I took a class this summer about how the brain learns, and they talked about how deeply connected emotions are to the learning process, and how positive emotions will deepen learning, it will create um, more retention, and the ability to dive deeper into that learning process and enjoy learning, um, and the negative emotions will sort of have the opposite effect. And so, ideally, as an educator, we would want to create those positive environments in our classrooms. And one of those ways, you know, as an educator, you come in, you can be happy and calm and patient with your students, but they also need to learn those things for themselves and how to extend that to their own selves and to their peers. So we need this. We need to get every level. And we think about it a lot with very small kids because they're kind of learning how to manage and be little humans, but also I teach high schoolers and they're still, they're in a moment where they're shaping an identity that's separate from their families and trying to figure out who they would like to be and things like self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision making, all of that is critical for them to be able to become successful adults who transition out of high school and then go on to live a happy and fulfilling life here in Nebraska. And that's all from me.
learning how to handle those big emotions, how to work in a group, how to, you know, be kind to other people. Um, as much as I try to teach it, uh, hearing it from someone that's not mom is very helpful. Um, so when they say our oh, parents should teach that, well, yes, we do. But also kids listen to other adults more. Um, and they're a lot of times better behaved for those other adults. So um, that's, yeah, social emotional learning is not the boogeyman that, that they're trying to make it out to be. Um, in the end, thank you for doing this because Michelle Bates, M I C H E L L A Bates. Okay. Um, and I have not been in elementary or kindergarten since I was well, 46 years ago. <laughs> so you all know how old I am now. And at that point in time, when you were, we had what we call dunce hats. We put on the stupid kids. We had rulers we got our hands hit with. Um, we got put in corners. Um, and then as I got older, I love my parents, they were very, very good parents, but they were boomers, and so Gen X kind of got kind of forgotten. We kind of hung out by ourselves, took care of ourselves and such. And so there, our social learning was with each other. You know, I mean, we, we kind of learned together. That's not a good way to grow up. That's not a good way to learn. Um, you ended up with some kids that were, you know, bullies. You ended up with some people in my generation who just are, are lost now as adults. And so social learning is important to teach you how to interact with others. So when I became an adult and went to work in the society after college, I was at a job and the owner was um, the owner of a long-term long -term care company owned nursing facilities. He actually had to do a training with supervisors, with nurses, with administrative about how to socially engage with your employees, how to have empathy, how to have kindness, how to work together, how to be a team. As adults, we were having to be taught that because that wasn't taught to us as we were younger, or it was not, I guess, it was not part of the curriculum like it is now. We shouldn't have to be teach adults how to be socially acceptable and how to socially interact with other people. That should have been done when we were children, when we were in school. So you have to have that. You have to have it as an adult. You have to be able to engage with others without conflict, be able to have different opinions, be able to voice your opinion without criticizing another person. And so social learning is something, it's just, just common sense. It's just how you should raise your children and how you should be, and school should also teach that also. So I guess I kind of want to give you an example of, I was one of those who didn't learn social acceptable manners, had to, but I did as, I did, my parents did, but not at school, but I did as an adult also too. So, and you have to have that to live and to be able to get along with others. If you can't get along with others, then you know, you're awful lonely. So, thank you. Um, would somebody mind just shutting the door? Sorry, just the one right there. I realize I talked to the best like an hour ago. <laughs> uh, anyone else wishing to speak? No? All right. Really? Last chance. Because a lot of people in here have not spoken yet. I know, I'm like, I don't want you to feel like you definitely don't have to, but. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Another one of those fully intended to come and, and listen and provide uh, support as a human being and bring my daughter, who will be a future teacher, um, in another year. She'll, she's um, going to be trying to be a teacher. And, which um, and my name is Abby Burke, um, Dr. Abby Burke, um, not the kind for medical emergencies, the kind of research and stuff. Um, so, I, as I was driving here um, from Omaha, listening to Taylor Swift and um, bouncing back and forth between the other um, hearing, um, one of the things that I noticed um, happening was this sort of vilification of our current education system, um, the Nebraska Department of Education, um, the teachers, administrators, um, and that broke my heart as a, as a lifelong educator. 
um, to hear about the hard work that we're doing, that we eat, sleep, and breathe as an educator, Saturdays and Sundays. I mean, we, we live for those students. Um, and so it really broke my heart that, um, that, that those folks are being vilified. Um, and I noticed that it was really intentional that, and very strategic. Uh, right now, it looks like we're talking about SEL. We're talking about CRT. Um, and, but it's, it's, the way that it was spoken about and the way that I heard about it in the hearing was different. It's not about CRT. It's not about SEL. It's about the um, uh, deprivatizing our education system, elevating the folks that are not experts in the field of education, um, allowing them to make decisions about what I know as um, somebody that has a doctorate in education I have a body of knowledge that um, my husband doesn't have. Um, he knows a lot about the nerve health, health sales industry. I don't give him input on that because I don't know about that. But I know a lot about education. And he turns to me and he says, hey, when we're at this parent-teacher conference, you know, what do you think about this? And I, and I tell him, well, I know um, that when we're talking about reading that we need to use um, systematic, multi-sensory, um, teaching in order to teach um, phonics instruction. Um, and so he says, okay, well, Liam, you can talk to the teacher about that. Um, and you can have that collaborative conversation because I'm also an educator. So I want us to really think about why are we here? What is it really about? Um, is it about social emotional learning? Is it about, is it about CRT? And what was, I forget what the third bullet was. What's the other LR? Comprehensive sex education. Thank you. Thank you. Just as important as the others, but um, so so I just want us to really think about: is that what it's really about, or what is it really about? Um, is it about taking away the expertise about education? I feel that's really a big piece of it. Is it about um, um, devaluing our public education system? Is it about supporting and taking tax money, um, tax credits from our general funds to be placed um, to support um, private schools where students can be? discriminated against, um, things like that. So I think, you know, as we're talking about this, I think we sometimes we need to take, take a, um, a, you know, a higher look from the balcony and say, what is this really about? Because otherwise we might get stuck in this conversation about SEL or about sex ed or about um, um, critical race theory. What, let's get it, let's get it and dig out into the why behind that. Why is that the boogeyman today? And that's, I'm, you know, as I'm driving down here, of course, I immediately take a break and let the senior has swifty and then come back because my blood got a little elevated. Um, but I do, I think we need to really uh, dig in and think about that, uh, about what it, what it really is. Um, and today, these are, have to be your three boogeyman. Thank you. Yes. Do you think it's about a fear? <laughs> um, well, but I think about you know I think about literacy and I think about education is about um, liberation, liberation for all. It's about democracy. So yes, if we're taking away and controlling our education, we're taking away democracy. We're taking away liberation for all. So in a way, yes. Um, My name is Carol Dix, and um, just to say, yeah, so it's all about privatizing almost everything. It's about uh, deregulating almost everything in a very methodical way. Uh, Republican incrementalism has kicked our butts. Um, but it's also about hate, whether real or a tool from a policymaker. And it's about hate that's been part of our country from the beginning, before the beginning. Um, and so it's, it's used, and it's so horrible that it's being used. So we need to speak up. We need to be like, 
uh, strategic, long term, short term, you know that, but asking guys to mobilize us, please, in that process. Um, because 2024 is going to be very important, but our 2023 elections are very important in every day of this legislature, and this is being mimicked in different ways across the country in red states and supermajority majority. Um, but a lot of people are too busy and too distracted to know about it, so we've got to have hard conversations with our neighbors, our pharmacists, the grocery clerk, family, friends, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for reading with me. Anyone else? Hello, my name is Sally Shepard, and I was a public school teacher for 29 years. I have been, um, I'm starting my second year of substituting now. And I just wanted to say, Teachers get accused of a lot of things. And if we could really indoctrinate students, every teacher would indoctrinate them to show up every day to class, <laughs> be prepared, have your homework done, engage in the discussion, and do your own work. That's what we want from our students. Were there a couple times I did some grooming? Probably, when I had a very um, delicate conversation with a student or two about the use of deodorant and maybe showering right away. <laughs> That's it. That's what we do. We're not here to harm anybody. We're here to help kids find their voices. And kind of on an unrelated note, um, I, I tell my students all the time, when I retired, they said, how can you leave us? And I said, guys, if I could just stay in the classroom with you every day and that's all I had to do, I would have never left teaching. I loved it so much. It was the best part of my life, other than my son. We have, um, I, I taught at Westside High School, and we had large groups there, which are like a college lecture class. So the first day in our freshman health class, after we got everybody seated and went over what we're gonna cover, and if you have questions about what we cover, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, I said, we're gonna have a little discussion here. You, you have to raise your hand, you have to have a point, and you cannot shout at anyone down. You cannot use negative words to, to refute someone else's point. I said, okay. I said, there's a hot dog and sandwich. That was the discussion, and you should have seen these kids. I almost cried. It was beautiful. They raised their hands. They were passionate about their points. They refuted arguments, but never once did they call anybody stupid or dumb or had any negative thing to say. And it was beautiful to watch these kids have this discussion. I finally stopped them. I said, do you know what you guys are doing right now? And they're like, we're talking. I said, you're having civil discourse. If the United States representatives and Congress it could see this, it would be amazing. And it just proved to me, man, it's not the kids that get it wrong, it's the adults. The kids are fine, it's the adults that screw things up. So I just wanted to say that. I, I appreciate your humor. I, I always love good jokes. So, but I wanna get serious for a second mm -hmm. because of your experience. So I noticed that, and I hate to be a downer, but for the suicide rates, mm -hmm. Um, amongst teachers has actually gone up substantially. Mm -hmm. And I have two questions. In your personal opinion, mm -hmm. I, you didn't know I was gonna ask this question, I don't expect you to have data and facts there. I'm actually asking your opinion. Would you say that the mental health of our teachers um, is at a level which become more concerning? Yes. And do you feel that you're getting the appropriate help for that concern? I've never struggled with mental health issues until we came back from COVID. And um, I had a student, I love this kid, and he's a teeny tiny thing, and he loved football more than anything in the world. And his white football gloves never got dirty, because even in freshman B games, he barely got in. But every Monday, we would talk about Monday night football, we'd bet on the games, it just went or lose, we weren't betting money or anything. And one day, in the alcohol unit, he kind of hung around after class, and I said, what can I do for you? And he says, well, you know, we're talking about alcohol, and um, my dad's an alcoholic, and my stepmom owns a bar and makes it hard. And I'm just like, I didn't know what to say to him, you know? And I thought about that day driving home, and I just started bawling on the way home, and I'm like, why can't kids just have a normal childhood? It doesn't have to be great, it doesn't have to be special. 
why can't it just be normal? And that was the hardest thing for me. At dealing with all the COVID and I was tired and stressed and then this came out of the blue. Kids will tell you things out of the blue mm -hmm. and you're just not even prepared for them. And my son is a police officer and we talk about all the time how we are not prepared and we're not trained to deal with all the mental health issues that we deal with and it weighs on us as well. Like if I could have taken less home to live with me, I would have. Because that poor kid doesn't deserve to go through that. The three, I, in 29 years, I never filed CPS report until my last year and I filed three. Two girls came to me to report a sexual assault. Two separate girls came to me to report that. Another student reported me that his parents were abusive to him. And it's, you have so much weighing on you and it's just so hard. Now my district has been fantastic about that, about providing support for teachers, about if you need a mental health day, you take them. But I think, yeah, and when I talk to younger teachers, they really struggle with it. And so it is harder, but I think um, school boards and I think admin understands that and they go through cue because I check in with my admin. Are you guys doing okay today? How are you today? You know, because they struggle as well. But it is a lot different. Things that, kids will tell me things that I never saw. I was at a football game, working a football game one night on the chain gang. And this kid I had in class, he was doing photography. We are just down and talking. He said, your, your son's a police officer, right? And I said, yeah, he is. And he said, my dad was too. And I said, oh, what's he doing now? And he goes, um, he died. He committed suicide. And I'm like, and then the ball moved, and I had to go running away from this kid. And I'm like, oh my God, it's a Friday night. And now, so I talked to his mom about it. She said, he's never told another teacher that. And I'm like, they unload things on you when you just least expect it. And that's just really hard for teachers sometimes. I appreciate your honesty. Thank you. Anything else? I, I got to work with your daughter, and she's wonderful. <laughs> Molly Davies, born Mary Davies, M-A-R-Y-D-A-V-I-E-S. Do I have to do all that? You don't. But <laughs> <laughs> you did, so I'm not habituated. Yeah. Um, I didn't prepare anything. I just spent um, the last couple hours in the other hearing, and I think what I'd like to say is how misguided I think what is going on is. I just have heard so many falsehoods and just like falsely represented things. I just heard a woman represent our uh, second step counseling curriculum. It's a counseling curriculum taught by certified school counselors. Um, and it's it's in use in many of the Nebraska districts. I think that, oh, um, my district is moving to a new one, but um, it's, a, it's a good curriculum. And, and the objection was that a seventh grade boy was taught about consent. That's an objection that we're teaching seventh grade boys about consent that's hurting her son. I just don't, I don't even know what to say anymore. Um, in my role as a um, educator, I'm a public school educator, I'm a public school parent, and I'm a migrant and refugee ed uh, educator. So I'm gonna speak from that lens. I couldn't function without social emo emotional learning. Um, I wouldn't say most of the students that come to me have trauma. I would say almost all of the students that come to me have trauma. And so the ability to process what they're experiencing when they come to the United States, but also what they experience because of Nebraska sometimes. I know that we have all read um, the articles about the abuse of youth, especially migrant youth, in the agricultural sector and in fast food. That is happening in the state of Nebraska. I have reported that to the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, the reality that so many of our kids are trafficked into the states that they end up into where they're living with somebody who is identified as an auntie or an uncle, but it's not an auntie or an uncle when they're working off a debt um, when they're early in the United States. I have kids that are in school all day and that are working from four o'clock until midnight and then they show up the next morning at 7.35 and they're expected to be ready to learn. Um, and we need to take care of them. We need every resource that we can possibly access for that and social emotional learning is one of the top ways that we can get there. The misrepresentation of social emotional learning as 
CRT or the equation of um, CRT and culturally responsive pedagogy is just absolutely a recharacterization and a mischaracterization that is detrimental to our students of color and um, and really all of our students because if white kids don't understand reality and if, if, if white kids don't have the capacity to manage their own emotions and to identify the reality of our history then they are also incapacitated. Everybody deserves access to a good curriculum. And the last thing I want to say is there is a, a piece of this that just befuddles me, which is we know because there's lots of edu educational research that shows this, we know that a good SEL and a social studies curriculum that actually teaches the truth about American history is one of the things that supports greater academic access for students of color. We are in the middle of a fight in this state to uh, decide whether or not we're going to spend money from our general fund on scholarships and much of the justification for that fight is that we need to serve students of color better. The same people who are advancing that are often the same people who are saying that we shouldn't be teaching this. And those two things don't go together. So either there's a, there's a future danger that we have to be looking out for, or there is a complete hypocrisy that is on the table right now. And one of those two things has to be true. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, one thing that you can do mm -hmm. to impact social emotional learning legislation is to. Oh my God, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, I had to. I had to get it in, Molly. Yeah. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak today? Okay. I think that that's gonna then conclude it. So thank you all. Thanks so much for your time and attention.